Great. All right. So we're very happy to have William Craig uh, speaking today, and he'll be talking about variants of Lamer's conjecture. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate this. Just quick introduction to myself. I am a second year PhD student at the University of Virginia studying with Ken Ono, uh, who is one of the co-authors of the pay uh, on the two papers written on this project. Uh, we I also worked with Professor Jennifer Balakrishnan and postdoc Weilun Tsai at the University of Virginia on this project. And I want to thank all three of them for the uh, for the collaboration on this really fun and really cool project. And so without further ado, we'll just dive into the topic of variance on Lamer's conjecture. It's not working. There it is. So we begin with Ramanujan, as uh, as we often do in number theory, uh, specifically his paper on certain arithmetical functions from 1916. And in this paper, he introduced the tau function and the uh, delta function, which are related. And we see here the tau function defined by the coefficients of this infinite sum, or which is also viewed as an infinite product in the way that you see listed below. And this function, which is called the delta function, uh, is a weight 12 modular form for the modular group SL2z. And it's in fact also a cusp form. And these functions are extremely important through lots of math. And just to review the definition, what we mean when we say it's a weight 12 modular form for SL2z, we mean that for any matrix A, B, C, D in SL2z and any Z in the upper half plane, the modular transformation law given below holds for this delta function. And uh, modular forms appear all throughout math and physics, particularly whenever number theory shows up, there's a lot of modular forms. So just to go through examples of how ubiquitous these things are, in arithmetic geometry, uh, modular forms come up a lot with elliptic curves and the Birchins and Dyer conjecture. Uh, in number theory, partition functions, quadratic forms, a lot of generating functions turn out to be modular or tightly related to modular forms. And so they come up a lot whenever you're dealing with generating functions. In mathematical physics, we have mirror symmetry that involves modular forms. And representation theory, uh, moonshine is closely related to modular forms and uh, representation theory of the symmetric groups also brings in a lot of modularity. Another important piece of testing ground related to Ramanujan's tau function are the Hecke operators. So Mordell proved in 1917 that these that the tau function is multiplicative. So for GCD of n and m being one, tau of n m is tau of n times tau of m, and for a fixed prime p, then the tau function is has a recurrence relation. Uh, for the when you think of tau of p to the m, uh, we have that recurrence relation, which will be of great use later. And the way that this is proven is through the, or fleshed out rather, is through the theory of Hecke operators on these new forms, and then the, well, the on the modular forms, and then the theory of new forms, which are eigenforms for these operators. Another important area that arises in connection to the tau function is that of Galois representations. So as usual, we if we define sigma sub nu of n as the sum of the nth powers of divisors of n, then the tau function satisfies these very pleasing congruence conditions, mod three, mod five, and mod 691, relating to these uh, divisor sums. And this can be extended using the theory of Galois representations by Stair and Delane. These were, they reformulated these in terms of these representations of the absolute Galois group of Q. And Wiles used uh, famously Galois representations in his proof of Fermat's last theorem in the 90s. And so this, a lot of this stuff uh, arose out of the theory of the tau function. And so its properties are Quite interesting. Another interesting uh, testing ground is the is Ramanujan's conjecture. So Ramanujan, in his paper, conjectured in 1916 that the tau function at prime p is bounded above by two times p to the 11 over two in its absolute value. And uh, Deline, when he proved the Vey conjectures, uh, his proof 
implied Ramanujan's conjecture. And this has been generalized to uh, general new forms and automorphic forms of all sorts. And so this tau function has been for a long time a testing ground for so many different areas in mathematics. And so whenever we have a question about the tau function, it's worth studying that problem and trying to generalize it to these other areas. And in this light, we want to talk about a conjecture of D.H. Lamer. Lamer in 1947 conjectured that for n greater than or equal to one, the tau function is never zero. This is a particularly interesting value. If you want to study tau of n equals some value, of course, by multiplicativity, it makes a lot of sense to try to find where it's equal to zero first. And Lamer was able to prove himself that if tau of n is ever zero, then we could choose n to be a prime. So everything in this question is going to boil down to finding when tau of p is zero for a prime p. Uh, Serre in 1981 uh, and many follow-ups, including the most recent one, Thorner and Zaman in 2018, have uh, studied questions about how, for how many p, tau of p can be equal to zero. And the most recent result is that it's bounded above basically by log log x squared divided by log x. So in particular, this result tells us that the set of all primes p for which tau vanishes has density zero among the primes. Uh, this conjecture is also supported by a lot of numerical investigation. So this table just shows uh, some recent, some computations about how far up we've gone testing whether or not tau of n is ever zero in these ranges. And we've yet to find any instance where tau of n is ever equal to zero. So this conjecture has a lot of, a lot of numerical and theoretical support. Uh, first, we'll look at one way we could vary the uh, problem of Lamer. Instead of asking whether the tau function vanishes, we could fix a prime p and ask uh, for how many new forms do, is the coefficient zero at that prime p. And this gives us, uh, this leads to a result of Caligari and Sardari from 2020. So they fix a prime p and level n co-prime to p for their new forms. And they prove that at most finitely many non-CM level n new forms vanish at their p coefficient. And so this um, is, does not actually prove Lamer's conjecture, but it, is, it gives strong theoretical evidence that for these non-CM new forms, uh, vanishing at the p coefficient is quite rare on the level of varying the new form. The question we're going to talk about today, though, is a different variant. The way that we wish to vary the problem is instead of asking whether tau of n could be 0, we want to ask a more general question of whether tau of n could be some number alpha. Uh, in this direction, uh, a theorem of Murdy, Murdy, and Shorey from 1987, they prove that for any odd integer alpha, there are at most finitely many values of n for which tau of n is equal to alpha. And this proof, while it does establish that there's a finite number of solutions, has some problems. It's computationally prohibitive because it uses, uh, its proof uses linear forms and logarithms, which the, the upper bounds that come from that are just too large to be computationally feasible. So although it does prove at most finite many n, it's not, you can't really use it very well for actually solving the equation tau of n equals alpha completely. Uh, it has, this proof actually did computationally work for tau of n is plus or minus one. Uh, Ligeros and Rosier in 2013 showed in particular that tau of n is not plus or minus one after tau of one equals one. And um, no other cases were done explicitly using this method because of the difficulties in these upper bounds. So uh, because of the multiplicativity of the tau function, the natural place to start if we're trying to find whether tau of n could be an odd number is to, is to ask questions about prime powers. And kind of the core result that gets us into directions where we can solve these equations is that our theorem that if tau of n is a prime power and absolute value, then n must be p to the d minus 1, where p and d are both odd primes, and d must be a divisor of L times L squared minus one. 
So once we have this theorem, there's a fair, we can outline an algorithm for solving this equation. First, we just list all the finitely many odd primes that divide L times L squared minus one. And then we simply solve tau of P to the D minus one equals plus or minus L to the M over P prime. Of course, this isn't quite so simple. This step needs to be fleshed out in order to be uh, practical, but we will be able to solve this later on. To show some of the kinds of results we've been able to obtain with our method, uh, results from our paper combined with uh, the UVA REU students who extended some of these results. We now know that for n greater than one, tau of n is never plus or minus one, plus or minus 691, or plus or minus L for any odd prime up to 100. Uh, the UVA RE students also extended this result to odd alpha. This is basically just an exercise in the multiplicativity of the tau function, although there are some technical uh, details that need to be worked around in order to actually make use of that. To prove more general results, we don't just prove a much more general family of modular forms. In particular, we look at a cusp form of weight 2k and level n. And we need this form to have trivial Montu Galois representation. Basically, this means that the coefficients AF of n are odd if and only if n is an odd, close enough to being right. And in the case of the tau function, this is correct. Uh, examples of conditions where this holds uh, for any elliptic curve you go e over q, the associated modular form, will have this property if the curve has a rational two torsion point. And uh, we also know that any new form of level two to the a times m for m in that list and a greater than or equal to zero will also always have this property. So this property is fairly common. It's not it's not overly restrictive, but certainly not all new forms have this property. But once we know this property, we prove that if the absolute value of these coefficients are ever a prime, an odd prime power, then n must be p to d minus one, where p and d are odd primes and d satisfies the divisibility condition from before. Uh, some corollaries of this, uh, we are able to show for uh, these conditions on the weight of the new form in question that the coefficients can never be plus or minus one or plus or minus L for odd primes L up to but not including 37 along with negative 37. And if we assume GRH, we can move that 37 up to 97. Uh, so just some remarks about this theorem. Uh, analogous results of these probably will not hold for weight two. There is a there's a reason for this that will become clear as we uh, look at the role of K in later parts of our algorithm. And our method's actually a little bit better than this. It doesn't just tell us which things cannot be solutions. It tells us if something can be a value of a Fourier coefficient, it actually tells us where that value must be. For example, for the weight 2K equals four, the only potential counter examples to the previous theorem are listed below. So for all of the values that we were unable to rule out as these coefficients for the weight 2k equals four, the, if you have say negative 13 as a coefficient of your weight four new form with trivial mod to Galois representation, the only place where you can have negative 13 as a coefficient is, uh, is for n equals 17 squared. There are no other locations where you could find negative 13. Uh, also for, as another example, for weight 16, the only possible exception to our previous theorem happens at n equals nine, and the value would have to be 37 there. And uh, as mentioned before, the, R, the UV REU studying cases of odd weight, cases where the forms have nebentipus, and cases of uh, more general odd alpha. So as an example of just one more thing we can do with this, so for the weight 16 Hecke eigenform E4 times delta, there are no coefficients of this form whose coefficients have absolute value in odd prime from three to 37. And if we assume GRH, then we can move that up to 97. 
So uh, we also ask another question. Instead of varying the alpha, we can also vary the weight. M powers L to the M. If F has large enough weight, uh, which is linear in M with coefficients depending on L, then the then AF of N can never be plus or minus L. An example of the kind of upper the bound we're getting. So if for L equal to three, then this M plus or minus is we prove that it is that it suffices to let that be two M plus root M times ten to the thirty two. Uh, uh, the, the likely answer is probably much smaller than that. Uh, we do not think this is anywhere near an optimal choice of M. The reason the upper bounds are so large, or the lower bound is so large, is because of linear forms and logarithms. So we expect that these bounds could probably be improved a lot with better methods. So with all of these results, you might think that there actually are not any prime values of the tau function with all of the constraints that seem to be closing in on them. But we actually know that there are. For example, in 1965, Lamer found this one, quite a large prime number, but we know that there are some. And there have been a few others found by Ladros and Rosier in 2013. Another thing, we are not only able to study the primality, we're also able to study the number of prime divisors of the tau function. So if we let, as usual, omega of n be the number of prime divisors counting multiplicity of n, and little omega of n, the number of distinct prime divisors, our method enables us to prove the following lower bound on the number of divisors of the tau function. So we are summing over all the, summing over all the prime divisors counting sigma sub zero. So sigma sub zero being the number of divisor, the, the divisor count function here. And so the tau of n in particular must have at least as many distinct, at least as many divisors as n has distinct prime divisors or as many uh, prime divisors with multiplicity as n has distinct prime divisors. And this example, this bounded chart, uh, the example of Lamer where tau of 251 squared is prime, the, the, this formula pumps out one. So this, this bound is sharp. And there is a for new forms with energy coefficient and trivial mod to Galois paper. I will try to mention, I'll mention those as we pass them. So the goal is plus or minus L for L and odd prime. So for the tau function by Jacobi's identity, we can set delta function tau then Q to the N, summing over all N is equivalent mod two to Q to the power of two tables one squared. So in particular, this gives us trivial Montu Galois representation for the delta function. So if so, because L is odd, if tau of N is equal to plus or minus L, then N must be a square of an odd number. And by the hecka multiplicativity of these of the tau function mentioned earlier, and, and we know that tau of n is n must be a, uh, an even power of a prime. And now that we're in a case of prime powers, we can use the recurrence relation mentioned earlier for the tau function. And so we can all, we, because of the recurrence relation, of course, the sequence tau p of zero, tau p to the one, dot, 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 as listed is periodic modulo L. And in fact, the first time that L divides tau of P to the D minus one is necessarily going to have the condition where D divides L times L squared minus one. And now uh, is the big step in our proof. It would be very helpful indeed if we could assert that every term in this sequence, tau of p to the m, is divisible by some prime that does not divide any previous term. 
if that were true, well, then if the absolute power, if the absolute value of tau of p to the 2t were l, then 2t would have to be actually equal to d minus 1. Because if you went further down the sequence, then new prime divisors would accumulate and you could no longer actually be literally equal to L. So if we just work this out with some divisibility properties, then we would also find that D would have to be a prime. So D would have to be an odd prime dividing L times L squared minus one. And then we just solve, we would have to solve for P in the equation listed below. And as it turns out, we can translate this equation tau of p to the d minus one is plus or minus l into a into curves with genus greater than or equal to one. And these of, and these by Siegel's theorem will have finitely many integer points if they have any at all. And that is the basic outline of our proof that tau of n will be equal to an odd prime uh, only finitely often. So to move through to our big claim now, this, this is the key step that we need to move our problem along. So we'll define some terminology. Uh, so if we have any sequence a n, we say that a, that a of n has a primitive prime divisor if there is a prime L for which L divides a of n and L does not divide any previous element in that sequence. If A of n does not have primitive prime divisor, then we call A of n defective. Example from 1913, Carmichael, uh, if we look at the Fibonacci numbers, the ones shown in red are defective. For example, eight is defective because the only prime divisor of eight is two and two appears earlier in the Fibonacci sequence. 144, the only prime divisors are two and three. And both of those appear earlier in the Fibonacci sequence. And so all of, all of these red numbers are defective. And Carmichael proved that 144 is the last defective Fibonacci number. So, uh, what, so the one thing about the Fibonacci numbers, what we want to generalize here is the idea of the Lucas sequence. So we're going to pick algebraic integers, alpha and beta, with the properties that alpha plus beta and alpha times beta are relatively prime non-zero integers and that alpha over beta is not a root of unity. When this is true, then we define the Luca numbers for alpha and beta by the uh, generalization of the exact formula for the Fibonacci numbers, alpha to the n minus beta to the n over alpha minus beta. And these will all be integers and they will satisfy a recurrence relation similar to the Fibonacci numbers. The key step that we wanted earlier in our in our outline of a proof, the big claim, was that we needed these Luga sequences to have primitive prime divisors. And it is a result of Bilou, Honro, and Boutier from 2001 that all Luga sequences always have primitive prime divisors whenever n is greater than 30. And they actually do better than that. They actually list all Luca numbers that lack a primitive prime divisor. In other words, we know all defective Luca numbers. They fit into two tables. One, there are some sporadic counterexamples that have defect that are defective. And then there are a couple of explicitly param parameterized infinite families of Luca numbers that are defective. And now we want to talk about how this relates to our original problem for the uh, coefficients of these triple Montu Galois representation modular forms. So we call a Luca sequence potentially weight 2k modular at a prime p if this b if the product alpha beta is p to the 2k minus one, and if the sum alpha plus beta satisfies the Deligne bound, absolute value of a less than or equal to. 2p to 2k minus 1 over 2. We call these potentially weight 2k modular because, in fact, the AF, the, the coefficients of the forms that we are, uh, that we are, that we care about here, those forms will satisfy these rules. And so, since we only care, really care about Lukov sequences that find themselves embedded in the world of modular forms, we allow ourselves to assume these conditions. And so, once we 
uh, have these conditions, we can just look through the tables of Bubu, Hunro, and Voutier and apply these conditions to all of the cases they list and sort out the ones that actually fit into the potentially weight to modular category. And so these are the table, this is one of the tables we obtain. So like Bilo, Hunter, and Routier, our paper has two families of uh, tables for defective, potentially modular Luca numbers. The first is a sporadic table, which we list here. Uh, note that the sporadic examples, there are no sporadic examples for weights strictly larger than four. So most of those sporadic counterexamples are in weight uh, one or weight two rather. And then there are two listed, two rows listed in weight four. And this is our list of explicitly parameterized infinite families. And all of these are have th their values of n very small. And they and everything is very tightly constrained by lots of curves and lots of congruence conditions here. So key lemmas that we're going to need. We have uh, for Lucas sequences, relative divisibility holds. So if D divides N, then Lucas numbers with those indexes are divisors of each other as well. And for a Lucas sequence, if we let M, L, alpha, beta be the smallest index for which L divides the Lucas number at that index, then ML alpha beta is a divisor of L times L squared minus one. This is where that result is coming from. We also need to go over some properties of new forms that give us a connection to the world of Luca sequences. So for F of Z is Q plus the sum of AF of N, Q to the N. If this is a new form of weight 2K on level N, then all the following are true. Uh, these coefficients are multiplicative. If P is a prime not dividing a level, and if M is an integer greater than or equal to two, then AF of P to the M satisfies this recurrence relation. In particular, notice this recurrence relation is that of a Lucas sequence. And if P not dividing N is a prime, and if alpha P and beta P are the roots of the polynomial FP of X, which we give here, then these coefficients a f of p to the m are a Lucas sequence for, given by alpha p and beta of p. And it's this part three that allows us to use all of the results of Bilu, Hanna, and Routier for our, for our coefficients. And uh, the, we also have the Deline bound. These coefficients are bounded above by an absolute value by two to the power of p, two k minus one over two. So now, uh, now that we've talked a little bit more about Lucas sequences, we can revisit our strategy. Uh, recall earlier, if our coefficient is equal in absolute value to an odd prime L, then we can reduce to the case where N must be an even power of, an, of a prime P, an odd prime P. And from the observation that we made on the previous slide, this will be a Lucas sequence at index 2M plus one. And so what we can first do is first we just check all of our defective cases and uh, understand and make sure that uh, our Lucas sequence doesn't fall into any of the defective categories. If it does, then we will make a note of possible defects off to the side. And once we run through all the de defective possibilities, then we can assume that we are not in a non-defective case. And using the properties of relative divisibility and the first L divisibility, we obtain that the 2M plus one must be an odd prime D dividing L times L squared minus one. And so that is the proof of the first theorem we gave about the classification in terms of D. And we also know now that we must have these uh, D and P must satisfy a curve a f of p to d minus one equals plus or minus l. Uh, we call this a curve because although it's not in the form of a curve right now, we can transform it into a curve. And this will be the goal of the rest of the uh, construction problem. So we first deal with the cases of a f of p squared and a f of p to the fourth. These are the low lying cases where the curves are different than for higher powers of p. So if a f p squared is an odd integer alpha, 
then P comma AFP is an integer point on the hyperelliptic curve. Y squared equals X to the power of 2K minus one plus alpha. And for the exponent four on P, uh, the point really, this point related to AF of P is a point on the curve below. Now uh, I can comment on before when we mentioned that there are probably no analogous results when the weight 2K is two. This is because the nature of these curves is very, very different if 2K is two versus when 2K is greater than two. Now, if M is greater than or equal to three, we're gonna get different kinds of curves. So we define these, uh, these polynomials Fm x comma y in terms of this generating function. Uh, at the, when M is even, we call these the special cyclotomic 2A polynomials, which factor in the way given below. And so if F is a new form, that's then the coefficient a f of p to two m is the value of this uh, polynomial capital F at the point p to the two k minus one comma a f of p squared. And now back to an explicit example that we gave before for our classification of uh, odd primes l that cannot be coefficients of the tau function. So now we will give a sketch of the proof. So first, we list out all of the odd primes d that divide l times l squared minus 1. And by our previous theorems, we know that in order to solve the question of tau of n equals plus or minus l, we need only solve the equation tau of p to the d minus 1 is plus or minus l. So you just want to rule out all of these examples. So for each of the d we listed out, we need to solve that curve. And based on the value of D, we're either dealing with finding some kind of special integer point on elliptic or hyperelliptic curve if we're dealing with uh, D equals three or D equals five. And otherwise we're dealing with a solution to a two-way equation if D is greater than five. And using various uh, facts from the theory of Galois representations, more LA groups, the Chabotty Coleman method, uh, certain methods for solving two way equations, uh, we classify all the integer points on these curves and determine which of these actually correspond to coefficients of the uh, values of the tau function. So, a lot of different methods here. It very much depends on the case that you're in, which method will will end up working. There's too much here to actually list it all out, so we will not go through everything in exact detail. So by way of summary, if n greater than one is an integer, then the number of divisors counting the number of prime divisors counting multiplicity of tau of n is greater than or equal to the sum of sigma zero, order of p and n plus one, minus one, and then summing over all of the prime divisors of n, uh, you can, from what we've already discussed, you can see the truth of this by first considering the case when p is a prime power. If p is a prime power, uh, what we are saying here then is that tau of p to the m, say, is greater than or equal to the number of divisors of m plus one minus one. And what, the reason we're counting these divisors is because of relative, dis, relative divisibility combined with the fact that the, um, the Luga sequences corresponding to the tau function all have no defective cases. So because of relative divisibility for each divisor of m plus one, there will be some primitive prime divisor at that uh, index in the Luga sequence. And so all of these prime divisors will accumulate in tau of p to the m. And of course, multiplicativity will do the rest of the work here. And as a remark, as we mentioned before, because tau of n is occasionally a prime, this lower bound is sharp. And we get fundamentally the same result for any new form with trivial modulo galois representation. The the, the change that might need to be made, uh, the formula may need to be adjusted if there are defective coefficients somewhere. Those can cause some problems. 
can make they can make their lower bound a little bit smaller, but it's never more than about subtract uh, the the actual way the bounds work. I don't I don't think I've ever seen a case where you where it's any more than subtracting three or four from the from this lower bound. The lower it's not even going to depend on n, say. And more summary. So uh, if uh, 2k is greater than or equal to 4 and af2 is even, and all the following are true. If the coefficient af of n is ever a prime power and absolute value, then n is p to d minus 1 for p and d odd primes and d dividing l, l times l squared minus 1. And uh, as a corollary of this, if the GCD of the weight is co prime, or the weight minus 1 is co prime to 3 and 5. Then uh, the coefficients a f of n are never going to be plus or minus one or plus or minus l for l in the range listed, and you can come up with lots of form. Uh, our paper, the paper we write, lists many of them, but there's there's we do not list them all in this in this presentation. And if we also assume grh, making uh, some of the curves a little bit easier to easier to solve, then we can move those bounds up into other cases. And if uh, for prime powers L, F has a large enough weight, then there is no form of that, of these large weights that has plus or minus L to the M as a coefficient for any M at all. All right, that is the, that is the end of the talk. Thank you for listening and I'll take questions now if anyone has any. Yeah, great. Let's just uh, thank Will for his talk. Um, cool. Yeah. Do we have? Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi. Thank, thank you, you for your nice talk. talk. Uh, if you understand that, that uh, if n is a prime, prime number, then, then uh, to n is prime, prime. Yeah. Uh, from, from your, your result. result. I'm sorry. You yeah, the audio is a little the audio is a little um okay. glitchy right now. Okay. Uh, so if, if I understand, understand, if you take a prime, prime number n, mm -hmm. so, so the tau of, of n is prime, prime from, from your result. result. That's so right. n is prime. Yeah, yeah, I think the question is about or if I'm hearing correctly, like tau at a prime equaling another prime. There's something about that. Is that correct? Oh, well, um, well, so what's going on here is if so, um, because because of the trivial Montu Galois representation property, yeah. uh, tau at a prime is going to be an even number. And so, uh, because we're only here considering whether or not tau of n is equal to some odd number alpha, uh, we don't have to worry about the value of tau at a prime. We don't have to worry about the values of tau at, at even powers of primes. Uh, uh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, if yeah. you want to know whether tau of n equals an even number alpha, well, then that's then you have to take that into account, and that's a harder problem. Uh, I see. I see. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, so, so, so cause it, it, uh, are there any conjecture? Uh, how, how many, many prime, prime, prime number, number let's, uh, let's, let's take, take L, can, can be value, values of the tau function? function. Uh, is it uh, prime or is it prime? I'm having trouble. There's like an echo on the audio. I'm having trouble hearing as well. Yeah, there's, there's, there's an echo that's making it really hard to hear. Okay, maybe I try again. Is it uh, better now? A little bit, yeah. A little bit. Okay. Uh, I am interested uh, to, to know how many prime, uh, maybe finite or unfinite prime, uh, can be uh, can be looked at as the values of the tau function. If you take the values of the uh, tau function. Uh, the values are uh, can be uh, finite or unfinite primes. Oh, are you are you asking? Uh, so is the question um whether or not there are only finitely many primes that can 
be values of the town function? Exactly. Yes. 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 Oh, um, I. Uh, we don't uh, we don't address that problem in in the paper. Um, it is a little it is tricky. I mean the 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 results that we obtain do they do suggest pretty strongly that these the the value that the that the primes that can be values of the tab function are exceedingly rare. I don't know if I would want to say that definitely there can only be finitely many, but I wouldn't be, I don't think I'd be surprised either way on, on that one. Um, I'd have to, I would have to think a little bit longer about that. Okay. But since this, since this method assumes a fixed L in advance, then I don't, then I don't see any, anything too direct from this that would give you say, uh, no, for, for fixed, 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 fixed prime L, uh, there are only many uh, uh, n. But, but for if you vary the L, the prime number of values, how many, what is the, the behavior of top n? n? Can be even prime number? I don't know. N. N? n? Yes. The, so, so the, um, so the n like the like this n. Yes. Uh, oh well, that n for the problem that we are solving, uh, n has to be an, a power of an odd prime. So if tau tau of n, let me let me click. Let me get to something. Where is this slide? Ah, uh, yes, here. So if we're solving the equation tau of n equals plus or minus l and odd prime, then the Jacobi identity will tell us that the odd values of tau of n only occur at even at squares of odd numbers. And so if tau of n is going to be an odd number or an, uh, equal to an odd prime, then that cannot happen for n a prime. It could only happen for n an even power of a prime. Ah, okay. Or a prime of even Ah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. We have uh, any more questions? Actually, I have a few questions. Um, so, okay. yeah. so, so is the the mod two uh, Galois representation? You just need that essentially, so you have uh, this condition about like an odd square, right? Um. And so, but then yes. like what you're yeah. saying, this restricts you to like odd integers alpha if you're trying to solve tau of n equals alpha. So is there something nice, like, um, I'm not 100% sure this is true, but I think there's something nice like of uh, tau of n, like modulo three or something, uh, you know, you can do this, you can have some sort of identity and maybe can you classify those? And so, uh, you don't have to then restrict to like odd alpha. I, I guess this is like, um, is there any other part of the proof that, that requires uh, this mod two thing? Or is it really just that we get this like nice formula when we have this uh, um, Galois presentation behaving this way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, the, the whole, the, the problem with the even alpha is in the Galois representation theory. The, the, the part with the Luca sequences, that doesn't really change at all. Uh, yeah. And the part with the reducing things down to algebraic curves and solving the curves, that doesn't really change either. It's all in the, it's all in the Galois theory where you get the problems. So you would need um, some kind of result, something like um, what Thorner, I can flip back to, Well, you would you would need something about um to to handle the case of tau of p actually whether that could be alpha for even alpha, and then for higher powers of p, well that's not that's going to be basically the same as what we've already done. So tau of p, so you would be looking at let me think. So you just, you would be looking at all integers that are not odd squares. And so you would be, you would need to handle the, um, the, the theory of primitive prime divisors would work for 
for like yeah. things like Tau P, Tau P to the fifth, Tau P to the seventh. And then Tau P, that's going to be where it's a little, that's going to be where the, that's going to be the difficulty. I'm, I'm just saying, so, um, right, if we replace this mod two thing with like mod three, for example, let's say specifically for the delta function, you get like some yeah. infinite product to the eighth power. There's a nice formula for that where it's only supported on certain exponents. Um, and so it's, you don't have something as nice as like, it's only supported on odd squares, but you do have like a, a there's a formula that it's supported on certain exponents that, that are predictable. Um, and so then you would, your condition on tau of n. Are you, I think you're talking, I think you're talking about this, right? Uh, uh, yeah. This yeah, would be tau sure. of n mod three, right? Well, yeah. uh, no, I mean, th these are the coefficients. I'm not worried about, I'm more worried about uh, just when you get non-zero coefficients. Um, so I guess it, it's just when n oh. is co-prime to three, you get a non-zero coefficient or something like that. Um, modulus, <laughs> or, no. It's just like, uh, right, the eighth power of eta has a nice uh, formula. It's, it's one of these. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 If you take, for, for example, the paper of Sir, the, the, that paper, you have maybe Coriolis modulo, for example, 23 or so on, and you have modular form in the right and left side. Maybe, maybe, yeah, you are, you are right. You have another, another expansion. Maybe the coefficient can be, can be, I don't know if uh, William explored that or not, yes. In yeah. Sir, in Sir paper, you mentioned in the beginning, in Sir paper. In Sir paper, there are other congruence as a young uh, asset. Yeah, that's all, that's all I'm saying is, is Sarah classifies the power of eta, powers of eta mm -hmm. that have complex multiplication. And so yeah. all these have nice formulas, like they're not as nice as the odd square thing. Um, I don't, I just don't know if it's worth it maybe to like the extension away from odd alpha to like now alpha that are co-prime to three is maybe uh, not that much more interesting though, you know, the, the, the work you've already done. Um, I guess I have also yeah, one of yeah. I mean, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So you're saying like yeah. So like it. it so like if it, instead of saying odd alpha, you like think about the problem of um. You're trying to locate Calvin equals alpha for alpha co prime to three, so and then using alpha. that. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I suppose you could try. You could you could try something similar to that. Yeah. I mean, I I, I haven't thought about that. I was you just certainly try. Yeah, so the mod two doesn't show up anywhere other than just uh, figuring out that it needs to be this this uh, odd square is all. Yes, I, I, yes, I, and I, then I, because, I, yeah, and because the odd square rules out tau of p for just p to the power of one, that, that makes the problem easier. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, so the other thing is you you mentioned uh, this behavior probably not holding for weight two new forms um, just because. Uh, whatever those hyperliptic or those those curves that you're finding classifying points on uh, later on behave quite differently. Um, is that yep. at all related to right? Like weight two new forms are uh, tied to like uh, elliptic curves. Are are those? Can you somehow see that behavior um, there, or is that are these like two e two e equation things really like a, a different kind of thing? I mean, the, the curves do come out quite different, but I, I'm trying to remember some of the details of this. One of the things that the UVA REU did, one, one of the teams did a lot of work with, with, the, with, with elliptic curves in, as relates to this problem. I forget what their, I forget what they came up with, but I think they were able to do something sort of similar. But, well, but, it, but, it, but it, it, did look, it did look pretty different. If, if you look at the UVA 2020 REU, oh goodness, what were the names of the students that did this? I don't remember their names right now, but there ought to be a paper on, on or a preprint rather on that on the 2020 UVA REU site that yeah, has some yeah, stuff yeah. about it's all the all the curves sort of problem. Yeah. Okay. No, I'll, I'll have to look that up. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah. All right. Uh, if not, let's let's thank Will again for his uh, very interesting talk. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Stop.